Good afternoon. It's Thursday, August the 11th, 2016. I'm Mike Snyder. I'm here at Carlisle Fire and Rescue Services with Jake Baker. Good afternoon, Jake. Good afternoon. Uh, can you verify that you are aware that we are audio and video recording this and we have your permission to do that? Yes. Okay. Uh, you're from Carlisle, right? That's correct. Where were you uh, living when you were born? Where was your family from? 428 North E Street. Okay. Carlisle. And how old are you now? 72. Okay. So when you were growing up, um, what school did you go to? I started out at the Penn School building. Mm -hmm. From the Penn to the Lee Tort. Uh, then we moved out on North Pitt Street. And I went to Stevens School. Mm -hmm. From Stevens, I went to the Lamberton. And then uh, from the Lamberton, I went to Cumberland Valley. Okay, so your family moved again? You went to Cumberland yes, Valley then? I lived in Middlesex then. Okay, and you graduated from Cumberland Valley High School? Well, actually I I left school to help out at home. Okay. Uh, but I got my GED. Excellent. Did you play any sports or did you not have time for anything like that because mm -hmm. of work? I didn't have time. I was working, helping us take care of my family, my mm -hmm. parents. Excellent. What did your parents do? My father was a truck driver. He was a veteran of World War II. He got wounded in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, my mother, she was a housewife, but she worked as a waitress at times, too. Mm -hmm. Did you have siblings? I had a sister and three other brothers. Okay. Are you the oldest, the youngest? I'm the oldest, and uh, my youngest brother, uh, it's, it's just him and I now. Okay. So after you went to the high school and um, you had to uh, work to help your family, then I believe you joined the service. Well, I got I, I was I got married mm -hmm. and uh, to my first wife, and yes, I, I joined the National Guards uh, for six years. Uh, and while I was in the National Guards, uh, prior to that, I took a I worked in a garage down in, on the. Harrisburg Pike to Mobile Station, which was uh, where I got, got uh, friends of mine talked to me that knew me that came in there, business people, and said that uh, I should try getting on the police department. So I took their advice and filled out an application and uh, found out, uh, took the test, and became a police officer. What year was that? That was August, August 11th, which is today. Wow. 1967. So this is your 49th year anniversary for uh, signing on to the police department in Carlisle. Yes, Whenever you came on to the police department, I'm sure that training was a lot different than it is now. Do you remember, did you go somewhere for training? I first went to uh, Harrisburg City Police School down in Harrisburg. Mm -hmm. uh, I did that. That was put on by the state. I did uh, two years of that and then uh, any other training that came along after that was done with that mm -hmm. and, and then finally in 1975 I went to the State Police Academy Okay. For, for the municipal police officers. Do you remember who the chief was when you were appointed? Uh, when, when I first started uh, it was Sergeant Frank Giordano he was acting chief at the time. Okay. And, and then, then shortly thereafter, chief. he was appointed yeah. chief. Who was the mayor then? Do you remember? Uh, mm -hmm. Charles Wise. Okay, so he swore you in. Yes. Okay. And I know that technology is a lot different th now than it probably was then. Do you remember what equipment you were issued when you joined the department? I was issued a, a, a revolver, handcuffs, a, a nightstick, a what they call a a sap. Okay, so like a striking device. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And non lethal. Right. And in the cars, I, you didn't have rifles then. You had shotguns. Uh, we had. It's a, it's a little. Let me think. We. I think we had shotguns. We did not have any. Uh, AM, FM radios in the car at that time. Okay. We did not have any air conditioning in the car, and our cars were painted black and white back then. Mm -hmm. 
but you did have a radio to communicate back and forth with the station. Well, there were some around. Okay. Did you have portable radios? Uh, not very many. Uh, not as many as what we should have had for the men. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we had banks of portables that, in the station that we grabbed, whoever were working. Mm-hmm. And back then, uh, when we were on, we had to do foot patrol downtown. Mm-hmm. And we had call boxes that we had to go to every hour we were there. And you would call back to the station and check with the desk sergeant? If, you was, if I was on duty, say, uh, in the evening or even in daylight and midnight shift, when I mean, you were walking foot patrol, which we did because 3 to 11 in midnight shift, we covered the downtown checking to make sure the stores are locked and, and nobody's breaking in anywhere. And some of the businesses, like the bars that were open, you know, we were nearby if there was a call. But uh, you had a call box uh, right on Liberty Avenue beside the courthouse, the new courthouse. You had a uh, call box on South Pitt Street there at the corner of South Pitt and West High. And then the third call box was up around on uh, at West Lawler Street uh, at North Hanover Street. Okay. And when you walked foot patrol, you had to make sure that you caught all those full call boxes during your walking tour. So you had a key, and they were uh, just you. phones in the box that you would call back That's to the correct. station. Okay. And during that time, do you remember how many appointed or sworn officers there were on the department? When I started, I was number 18. Okay. So you were issued badge 18? Uh, no, actually, I was issued badge 9. Okay, so you were issued badge nine, but there were eighteen sworn officers. Correct. And that everyone, was the 18th one. everyone was full time then. That's correct. Okay. And back then, and back in those times when I, I was working there, uh, the fire there was fire police, and actually back then the fire police were armed, mm-hmm. and they they rode along with the patrol cars. So they were basically auxiliary police yes. officers. Okay. Uh, you said that Chief Giordano was the chief. Do you remember who the other ranking officers were when you started? Uh, there was a Sergeant Adler. Is that Richard Adler? Yes. Okay. Uh, John Adler. Okay. Richard's father. Okay. Uh, John Adler, Mervyn Hill, and Leroy Washington, who was a uh, black officer. Okay. Were they uh, basically the sergeant for each shift? There were three shifts, and they each had one? That's correct. Okay. Did you rotate, or were you assigned to a shift back then? Uh, rotated. Okay. And do you remember any major incidents during your first, you know, three, four, five years, whenever you first started on the department? I remember, uh, I think my first red light call was... Uh, a body was found at, uh, at the bottom of uh, the cave at Cave Hill. Okay. And I responded out there uh, with lights and siren. Okay. And I found an individual, uh, a, a Spanish person, that was laying at the bottom of the cave. Do you remember if that was suspicious circumstances? Or? If it was suspicious, somebody... They he apparently got intoxicated and got in an argument, I guess, and they took him out there and threw him over. Hmm. As far okay. as the solving of that, I'm, I'm not sure if anybody was ever caught on it. Okay. I've heard stories before that sometimes Carlisle officers would go out and assist the state police and things like that. Do you remember a shooting that occurred at the Midway during a burglary in the late 60s? Oh, yeah. Can you tell us that story? Do you know the details of that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think. Uh, well, the details of that story was uh, we we were backing up state police. Like, they requested our assistance, uh, and uh, I wasn't working back then. I was off, and that was back when I had a canine, mm-hmm. and I was home with uh, being off sick with uh, problems with my foot. When I got the call to go out to the bowling alley with the dog, uh, yes, uh, we we got in 
when they responded out there and they had the place surrounded, uh, one of our officers uh, went into the bowling alley and there were the uh, pool tables were back in the corner. Somebody, the individual popped up from behind one of the pool tables and started firing and gunfire was returned. Uh, subject was wounded. The officer wasn't wounded, but the subject was wounded. At least we found out five times. Uh, superficial wounds, mm -hmm. enough to cause him to bleed. And uh, I was called out there to assist with the canine. And, and then William C Castle from Lower Island Township, who was another canine officer, uh, he was called, I started the first track with the dog in the snow drifts. Uh, that was a year we had a bad snow. Mm -hmm. And tracked him across the road, up over the hill, across uh, Holly Pike and up through the fields and lost his track uh, from the blood splatter. Whenever the, uh, when I stopped, he was, he had went over the a fence and the blood had froze, froze dry on it, mm -hmm. or was froze on the fence, and we could, we didn't see it, and the dog didn't get the whiff of it. Okay. Uh, and then we tracked, and then I I went back down to get better shoes because I was in loafer, loafers, and my father had brought me up a um, pair of boots at daylight, uh, about an hour or two later. So then we reached, then by that time the castle came and we started a, we started the track again. And we tracked him, tracked the individual up to Western Village where he stole a dump truck and then drove down to Lower Island Township on 15 uh, there by Ross Moyne Road at a trailer park where he lived. And searching the place where he lived, uh, uh, blood was found there where he came home and got cleaned up and him and his family left and went, uh, we don't know where he went, but eventually we got a call from Columbus, Ohio, where an individual stopped in the hospital to be treated for gunshot wounds. Hmm. And that's how we found him. Wow. Uh, that sounds like some pretty good police work to find somebody in Columbus, Ohio. Um, with the technology probably being a little bit slower back then as back far as communication. The they had the teletypes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, they didn't have the computerized stuff. And you mentioned briefly there that you had a dog. Um, when did you get a dog and do you remember the dog's name? Uh, I got the dog in 68. Uh, and myself and another individual got a dog and we had we had two dogs at that time. Uh, uh, it was in 68. Was it a German Shepherd? German Shepherd. His name his name was registered name was Hans Seewald Vom Little Cove. I purchased him from a Harrisburg police officer that uh, raised and trained dogs. It's hmm. very interesting. Um, one of the other major cases from the early 70s time period that a lot of people read the book is Bessie's house. Do you remember Miss Jones? Yes, sir. I was working at the desk that night. Okay. Can you tell us briefly what you remember about that? Well, what I remember is uh, we got a call that she, uh, she was murdered, and our people disp uh, went down to the scene. Uh, they found, found her down there in, in the bed, stabbed. Uh, and then we got, re then I got reports from the officers and detectives on the scene, uh, advising that she, who it was, Georgia Snyder, allegedly, and she uh, supposedly got a taxi uh, from Harrisburg. So with that information, uh, I made a call to uh, state police on the turnpike because uh, from what information we got, she may be headed to t towards McKeesport. Because uh, she was from that area, right? Yes. Okay. And uh, she got stopped uh, up in the 
on the turnpike actually by the state police at the Newville Barracks. Got stopped out going westbound in a taxi out, out by the tunnels. Mm -hmm. And we probably should say that she was acquitted at trial. That's correct. Um, and uh, no one was ever arrested and convicted for right. that murder. Uh, one of the other major incidents that ties in a little with your fire service is another homicide that was the Strand Theater fire. Were you working the police or were you there on the fire side for that? I was working the police that day. Do you have any recollection of that incident? Uh, other than uh, uh, a search was made of the building after the fire department got the, everything down, the fire down, and uh, the, a body was found inside this strand, or inside the strand, I think. Maybe, no. But uh, there was an individual a female jumped out the wind then. Mm -hmm. When she jumped out, she hit a parking meter or whatever and, and uh, killed, killed, died. And that case is still being adjudicated, but um, there that was some question. That individual is, uh, I guess, just here shortly, not a long time ago, uh, got out of prison. And right, right, Miss Smallwood. Um, not talking about the belief whether she's guilty or innocent because that's not our place to decide, that's but correct. there's some um, discrepancy as to whether it was an arson fire or not. Um, from what you witnessed being there, did it seem to you like it, it was an arson fire? Do you have any? I would say I, yes. Okay. Um, do you have any other recollection of any other police incidents during the 70s that popped to mind? Well, right after I started in the, in the 60s, 67, about a three, three, four weeks after I started, I, my, my first call, uh, I went along with uh, Chief Giordano and uh, Sergeant Calvin Baker, and him and I, and the, and, uh, the chief went up to, we got a report uh, from New York City, New York State, of an individual that killed his girlfriend, strangled her, and he uh, may be in Carlisle, staying at the James Wilson Hotel. And the three of us, went, and this was in the daylight shift, the three of us went up there and, and uh, knocked on the door, and the subject didn't come right away, but we uh, heard something some noise like a could have been a shotgun uh, being racked racking being racked pull it in but we found out later it wasn't but as soon as we uh, as soon as he answered the door uh, we grabbed him and pulled him out into the hallway and took him into custody with no no incident during that time period um was there any um, unrest due to the the activities during the 60s with um, uh, changes? Vietnam War, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, we had uh, civil disturbances. We had uh, our fires that were set uh, in during the year when that was going on. Uh, down at the old livestock market, which is down, used to be down by Agway, where Agway was, there by the railroad tracks. At on the, East North Street. On East North Street. Mm -hmm. That was set on fire. Uh, there was several other fires. There was a fire at the coal yard up on uh, West North Street. Uh, that was an arson. We had marches by the SDS, Students for Democratic Society. Mm -hmm. Dickinson College students. Correct, and the Black Panthers. Uh, now, were those generally um, peaceful protests? Uh, no. At one time, we had uh, the, the group of individuals from the college came to the Burr Hall. And back then, we were working, uh, we were in the station 24 hours a day. So dur during that time period, the Burr Hall is 53 West South Street, and correct. the police station is in the basement of that building. That's correct. Okay. So I'm sorry, go on. That's right. Uh, there was a meeting up in the town hall, and the individuals the big group of them uh, weren't satisfied with what the results were of the meeting. Uh, and I wasn't on duty yet. Uh, they 
they traveled out Pitt, out North Pitt Street, South Pitt Street, towards West High Street, and in doing so, they uh, threw garbage cans and stuff around and broke some windows. And then I got, uh, I, I was called, and me and uh, Detective Warner was called, uh, and we both jumped in the patrol car with the dog, and we went, uh, we went on patrol, and we found the. We were surveilling where where they were traveling, and when we come up High Street there in the 100 block, we saw them there on, on the south side of the street going west towards the college, and uh, it was a group of them. We uh, I went past them and I heard somebody hollering something derogatory, and and something to the reference of bring that dog back. And and they kept walking, and, and so we turned around to break the break it up, and we ended up um, breaking the breaking the group up, moving them up to the college, and at the same time we uh, chased an individual uh, who was ca caught and arrested and taken into custody. Other than those. Um fairly isolated incidents during the, the war years. Um, what do you think the relationship was between the college students and the community? Did it seem to be a disconnect or did it seem to be pretty? On, on some individuals it's called a yes. I, I felt there was a disconnect or, you know. Uh, but at one time, uh, at, during those times of civil disturbance, we were, uh, our canine people, we had actually five dogs, and we would, when they went, when they went to march on the army war college, we followed two dogs in a van on the side street, keeping a watch on them as they go, and uh, to, in case there was disturbances, uh, they marched out to the front of the army war college on North Hanover Street, uh, which was in, at that back end was the main entrance. And they were stopped by the military there, and we we stood by on the out, outer part on the perimeter, mm -hmm. uh, keeping an eye on everybody that was involved. Now, I believe that was in the spring of 1970, and they marched out there and had some speeches, and then marched back to town. Yeah. Um, and everything was fairly orderly, and and no one yes. got injured. Okay. Um. How long did you have a dog? Do you remember? Uh, I had well, I had the dog probably till seventy one. He I, uh, he he got German shepherds are known to get hip dysplasia, mm -hmm. and with all the work and that I did with the dog and stuff, training and doing the obstacles and all that stuff there, uh, the dog got hip dysplasia. So you had him in service for three, four years, yeah, somewhere around I had there. Yeah, put him down. Okay. What type of canine vehicles did you have back then? We used regular patrol cars. At one time, we had a station wagon uh, that we used a Chevrolet station wagon. But most of the time, uh, the chief had a, a patrol car set up to put the to put a dog in. Mm -hmm. And I assume that the dog lived with you and your family. That's correct. Uh, moving on to uh, the middle part or the later part of your career, um, you were promoted to corporal, right? In 1975, yes, sir. Okay. And after that period, you were um, you were still reported to the sergeant, but in the sergeant's absence, you would run the shift. Yes. Okay. Uh, 75 is when I, when I was corporal was when I had went to uh, State Police Academy for 12 weeks. Mm-hmm. Were you in patrol during your entire career, or did you have other specialized duties? Were you ever a detective? Uh, I was in charge of the criminal section uh, before Chief Giordano uh, retired. Actually, I was the operations sergeant okay. for a period of time in, in 89. Okay. And then in part of 90, and when the new, until Chief Margison came, I was acting chief. Okay. For that interim. Were you the senior sergeant during that time period? Yes. Okay. 
I was a senior sergeant until the day I retired. Um, do you remember when that happened? Like who retired to to move you into the basically second in command at that point, right? Uh, yes. But there were no lieutenants at that it point. No, it wasn't no lieutenants. Not until in the nineties. Mm -hmm. uh, sergeant Lamison was the one that was in charge when when he was still living. And then when he retired, uh, he retired before Chief Giordano did. And Sergeant Baker retired before Chief Giordano did, so you I moved, moved up. up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I believe you told me before that you were a, a crime scene officer. Uh, Sergeant, yes. Uh, before, before I made the rank of sergeant, when I was corporal, uh, before I went to State Police Academy, also, uh, Sergeant Lamson came to me one day and asked me if I could do a crime scene drawing of the. McDonald's on East High Street. They had a robbery there where uh, the employees were put in the freezer, walk-in freezer. Uh, so I, I did that. And that was my start of being a crime scene technician. And I did that up in, for 20 years. And there were very few people that had that skill set, so you did there that throughout no the county. Other, no other police officers in the, that did it on the, on the side. Mm-hmm. I, I did I did crime scenes for the township and uh, borough police departments in the county. That when when the DA would request me, mm -hmm. I did uh, all the major crimes for the state police in the county when I was requested. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a it was a good uh, thing that we had it. And basically, what that me what I was doing was taking my rough drawing after I'm out and measure everything by hand. Mm -hmm. Put it on a put it on a piece of graph paper, rough a rough drawing, and then eventually put it onto a big piece of poster board. Uh, with the scene, which was this helped the jury mm -hmm. when they were deciding the cases. Were you also doing photographs? Mm, no, I did not do. Photographs. Okay, so you were primarily drawings. Uh, back then, the police department had. Uh, Mr. Steinmetz? Steinmetz. Okay. Did the, he was the photographer of the mm -hmm. police department for crime scenes. And moving on a little to the 80s, I know one of the cases that we've talked about in the past is a homicide that occurred on Kerr's Avenue, right? Right. That was a Sunday afternoon, hot and humid. Uh, at 4 o'clock, I got sent by the sergeant to uh, go down on Kerr's Avenue and see what's going on down there. I got but down there and coming in, um, uh, up Kerr's Avenue from Hanover Street, I observed a body laying up a street on the right, and I was advised that there was another body inside and an individual barricaded in there with a rifle. Mm -hmm. And there was two small children in standing in their diapers outside the front door on the step. So my first immediate thing was to get those children out of the way. Okay. And then we, uh, help came. Uh, I had help from the, from the uh, DA's office, a uh, county detective. Uh, he, he came and I handed him the children. He was the first there. And by that time, then the rest of the, the rest of the patrols came. And do you remember how long that incident took to come to conclusion? Uh, a couple hours. Three, four hours, because it was it was it, it was dark whenever it did come to a conclusion. Mm -hmm. And chief, but we had him secured in there; he couldn't go nowhere. Mm -hmm. And the chief of police, Giordano, talked him out with a bullhorn. Okay. And that was the beginning. Uh, back in the '60s, when we had this, the civil disturbances, uh, we had uh, got firearms, rifles from. Uh, LEAA at the time from the government. Law enforcement assistance. Yes. Okay. And we put them in our arms room and uh, we had them sitting in there and not being used and I got with uh, S Sergeant Baker after that incident and we got with the uh, Chief Giordano and that was the beginning of uh, Carlisle's SWAT team. Okay. And so you responded out there and you realized that um, 
you didn't necessarily have the tactical equipment and skills that maybe you needed to handle situations like that in the have future. I didn't have a vest on me. I didn't have a uh, a shield mm -hmm. to carry. All I had was me. So did Carlisle officers have vests at that time? You just didn't have it that day? No, I don't think we had them then. Okay. And there were no shields available at all? No. Okay. Uh, what, when uh, when we did get them, finally we did get them right after that, I believe. Uh, we had them. And then uh, when, we, when I got the SWAT team form, I got us shields for entry mm -hmm. uh, from, from uh, ProTech, I think it was. Do you remember who some of the first operators were on your SWAT team from the department? Oh, uh, yeah, it was uh, Bobby Hayes, Ronnie Nestor, Ronnie Egoff, uh, Mike Guido, and Barry Walters. Mm -hmm. I think that was the first of them. Okay. And then later on, we added some more. Uh, by the time I left in 19. 95, there's probably 10. And then and right after I retired, they uh, got with other departments in the county and formed the county SWAT team. The Cumberland County SRT. Yeah. Whenever you were operating um, as the Carlisle Police Department, did you go outside the borough to assist? Or was it uh, primarily in, inside the borough? Inside the borough until we got, until we got the... Uh, multi-jurisdictional mm, Okay. Uh, in the 90s, like you said, in the early 90s, before uh, Chief Stephen Margeson came on board, you were acting chief. Uh, after he did come on board, um, you were a pat patrol sergeant running a shift, is that right? Uh, I was in charge of the criminal section. Okay. And then, uh, and then uh, Chief Margeson wanted to get uh, some lieutenants on board, so they had to test for lieutenants, and uh, and then Lieutenant Kaiser and uh, Lieutenant Walters were the lieutenants, and I moved back to patrol. Okay. Um, do you remember any stories that stick out to you as particularly funny or humorous during your time on the department? Uh, it probably was. I mean, stupid things happened. <laughs> and that was one thing, you know, uh, sometimes you could laugh at what happened but, mm -hmm. uh, and be serious when, it, when you can't laugh. Uh, and I think that helped keep my sanity. <laughs> <laughs> so you retired then from the Carlisle Police Department in 1995, is that right? Yes, sir. 28 years of service. Yes. And during that 28 years, um, you were also uh, appointed as a part-time deputy sheriff for Cumberland County. Is that right? Uh, yes, I worked uh, on my days off uh, when the sheriff failure would need me or Sheriff uh, Beck. Uh, I'd work on my, I'd get scheduled, and they'd let, I mean, let me know if they needed help, and I'd work. I did that for uh, 18 years. And then after you retired from Carlisle, you switched I over and I was Friday from the Car borough of Carlisle with in '95, and on Monday afternoon or Monday morning, that same that following Monday, I uh, went to work for the sheriff full time for another. Uh, well, I was in my 18th year when I retired from the sheriff's office. So you had over 45 years of law enforcement experience here in Cumberland County. Yes, sir. That's pretty impressive. We thank you for that service. Um, during that time at the Sheriff's Department, I know one of your duties was the warrant section. Is that primarily what you did during your entire career there? I, had regular, I, did, some, I did regular duties at the Sheriff's Office, uh, like the regular deputies, but then, and then I was put over into the uh, warrant section. Uh, where we handled uh, escapees from the prison, mm -hmm. uh, which were mo most of the time were work release inmates. Walkaways. Walkaways. And one thing with Sheriff Klein, he he wanted us to track them down and find them and get them back in, which we did. That's Sheriff Tom Klein, right? 
That, that's correct. Okay. And then you also worked for Sheriff Anderson during your later years, is that right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, anything during that time period, any folks that stick out or are memorable that you work with at the Sheriff's Department that you want to talk about? Oh, they all the men that, that I worked with at the Sheriff's Office and women who were good, good people. Uh, I had a couple. We we would uh, when I when I first got there, uh, Sheriff Tom Pine left me. I made arrests, traffic arrests, mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, uh, and I did investigations like tracking these people down. And I had took a, a woman one time a walk off from the prison. I. I worked on that case for two and a half years and got her brought back from Illinois. Wow. And before I retired, I had a walk off from the prison uh, from their place of employment where they were put. And I tracked them down. It was a man, a, a man, a male. And he, he had a female companion that he hooked up with. And... Uh, uh, I tracked, they got arrested out in uh, Colorado after uh, doing, after stealing, uh, burglarizing a, a home in Tyrone and out in, and then they hit uh, New Mexico, Utah, Oregon and I kept tracking them the whole time and, and I finally got them back right before I retired. Now you're talking about some of these um fugitives many states away. Um, did you take trips to recover them and transport them back? Uh, I took, I did a lot of extraditions, yes. Driving extraditions and flying. Uh, I flied a couple times while I was there. That seems like something that could be um, difficult or um, problematic. Did you ever have any issues bringing people back? You're uh, with people that are under arrest for a long period of time. No, I, I, I tried to uh, treat them with respect, which made my trip easier. Mm -hmm. uh, my main goal was uh, to make sure that they did not escape from my custody. Mm -hmm. uh, they, were, they were shackled and belted and handcuffed, and, and, they were, and there was myself and another deputy. We would uh, bring them home. I went to Alaska. Sheriff and I brought one back. Uh, yes, uh, I tried to. If they had to, if we were on a trip, we we fed them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, and made sure they could they could go to the restroom or whatever. I mean, they were they were told prior to leaving. You know, here's the rules of the road, and they all. I never had any problem with anybody. Yeah, you treated them with respect, and you you got it back. Yes. Okay. Um, wrapping up your law enforcement career, I guess, um, when did you retire from the Sheriff's Department? I retired uh, March of 2012. Okay. Is there anything else that you can think of during your Carlisle Police or Sheriff's Department career that you think would be um, interesting or you'd like to get on the record? Uh no, no. Okay. Everything. Uh, once you're in law enforcement, you should hopefully that's what you want to do, uh, and be dedicated to your job. This is uh, sort of a difficult period right now for law enforcement um, officers are under a great deal of scrutiny. Um, things like body camera technology, um, obviously that wasn't something that was there whenever you were an officer, but do you think that's a good thing, a bad thing? Anything to help a police officer on the street to handle any situation and document that situation, that's good. Do you think that um, during your career um, you experienced good relations with the um, minority community here in Carlisle? Do you think that was an issue? Uh, there, were so, there was some issues. Uh, but we always tried to handle it, you know, to get along with people, which we did.
Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, there's good people. Okay. Uh, then let's change gears a little bit and let's talk about your service as a uh, member of the fire department here in Carlisle, which I think you're approaching your 50th year of that as well. Um, you joined the Cumberland Fire Company, is that right? That's correct. When was that? 67. Okay. And you lived on the East End near the station at the time? Uh, no, actually I lived uh, out in the uh, Homar Estates on South Spring Garden Street. Okay. Uh, trailer court out there. What do you think made you join the Cumberland? Did you know some folks there, or how did you reach that station? Yes, I knew folks from there. Okay. And during your early time at the Cumberland, do you remember who the president was or who the foreman was? Uh, well, Bill Allwood was a foreman one, one time, mm-hmm. William Allwood. Uh, Mark Boyles was another foreman. Uh, Johnny Schaefer was a foreman at one time during the 70s, I believe. Uh, Trying to think who the foreman was in the beginning when I was there. I think it was Bill Wallwood. Okay. And fairly quickly, um, you had positions with the company of responsibility. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, one thing I did, I was a relief driver. I drove, I drove the equipment when I was there, mm-hmm. uh, working shift work or whatever. When were relief drivers required during that time period? Do you remember? Was it weekends or evenings? Weekends. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember who the drivers were whenever you first came on board? Well, the dri- when I first came aboard, uh, Red Hayes was the driver back then. Mm-hmm. Or Budman, Mr. Budman was. He was. He was. He was after Red Hayes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Budman was the driver, and uh, and. The, some of the relief drivers, I think, were uh, Dick Sugarts, one, who uh, later on became the driver. He was the full-time driver for over 20 years? Yes. Okay. Actually, yeah, over 20. Uh, he's got 50 years coming up, too. Okay. Um, during that time period... Um, the drivers were important for the operation of the station. Um, they were there the most, and if you were in the good graces of the driver, you were probably doing okay. Um, likewise, if you were in the bad graces, you, you might not have a good experience. Um, do you remember anything about any of those folks, um, good, bad, otherwise? Uh, no, they were, everybody was all right. Um, everybody got along. There was times you had conflicts with somebody, but we got it straightened out. The Cumberland was um, fairly well known for having a lot of people around, um, being a very active station. Um, Can you describe a day at the Cumberland for us, Um, how many people are around, what they're doing, the activities around the station? Well, you'd have probably... 10, 12 people sometimes during the day. Uh, it was volunteers. We had back then, we had volunteers. Uh, there was no paid people except the drivers. Uh, but we ran ambulance, we ran rescue, we ran fire. You brought up the ambulance. Is that something that you participated in as a member? Did you drive the ambulances as well? I drove the ambulance, and uh, actually, uh, with, I had first aid training uh, years ago, and I ran, I rode in the back sometimes too, either to help us. Uh, so, then we had, then we got EMTs, mm-hmm. and and then uh, an EMT would go along and they needed help, and I help them in the back if they needed, or I'd be driving the ambulance. When you joined in 1967, can you tell us what the equipment of the company was like, what apparatus you had? Uh, we had a 1947 Aaron's Fox piston pumper. That was our engine. Our rescue truck was a Ford Econoline, uh, an old red flat front 
on the line, loaded with uh, rescue tools, and our ambulances were uh, Cadillacs. Do you remember roughly how many you had at that time? Cadillacs, we had two. Two. Okay. And then later on, we got rid of the uh, the con line and, and had uh, Swab uh, in Elizabethville, Pennsylvania, build us a uh, international rescue squad truck. Okay. And the and also they built an, a Dodge uh, box type ambulance for us too. And in 1970, um, the Aaron's Fox Pumper um, was replaced with an American LaFrance. That's correct. Do you remember Pumper. when that was delivered? Um, no, I, I don't. Okay. Uh, were you a driver of that engine as well? Yes. Okay. Do you remember how long you were a part-time driver for the company? Mm. I think uh, I think whenever we moved. When when you merged in 1984. In 84. Okay. Um, we talked briefly about the Strand Fire and uh, Bessie's house um, during your service with the police department. Um, were there any other fires that you attended with the fire company in the late 60s, early 70s? That uh, we had the fire uh, up on West High Street. There were used to be uh, Harris. Harris Bank or whatever. There, there was a bowling alley there, the drugstore. The Cumberland Valley Savings and Loan? Yeah, there by the, where the Cumberland Valley Savings and Loan yeah. is, was. I believe that's June of 1970. Um, we had we had uh, the bowling alley, Maple Lanes, I think it was. There was a drugstore built in beside there on the left, on the south side of High Street, uh, West High. And we got we responded with the box on that fire call. And we, got our, we went around and the, the back, and uh, when we went through the back door of the fire, you could, it was burning. Mm -hmm. So then we hooked up to the uh, fire hydrant, and the box uh, hooked up lines from other fire engines to feed off, too. And that was quite a long term operation, right? Yes. It started very late at night, and you yes, were still there in mid-afternoon. It was early in the morning when, when the call came in. Okay. And, uh, and then we were, uh, I was up on top of the roof with other and other individuals. Uh, they got a flat roof and it started to bubble, and we, they, they, they told us to get off. Mm -hmm. So we did. Are there any other fires during that time frame that stick out in your mind? I'm sure there was other ones, but that wasn't one of the big ones. Okay. Um, during 1980, um, the American LaFrance engine was converted to a rescue squad, squad yes. and you got rid of the other rescue squad. Um, is that something that was um, popular or unpopular within the company? Was that controversial at all? Uh, it was some controversial, but... Uh, in the, in the end, everybody enjoyed what it was, what we did with it. Mm -hmm. And that, then uh, actually, uh, that truck uh, was uh, responding to a call in '81 down in Middlesex. Got on in the Middlesex and was going northbound and going the ramp and rolled over on its side. And nobody was injured. Mm -hmm. And I think that was around 1984. It was very icy. At exit 52, is that right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. And I believe uh, that was Dick Sugar. It's the career driver that was driving. He was driving, it. and I forget who was on the on the squad with him. Okay. But nobody was seriously nobody injured. Hurt. Okay. But the company did um, sell that piece of apparatus then and replaced it with a, a Sutphin Rescue Squad shortly thereafter. Is that right? Yes. Okay. During that same time period. The um, the company decided to merge with the Goodwill Fire Company and move to West Ridge Street. We were uh, notified and talked to and referenced to Goodwill, yes. Uh, and we decided uh, to go to Goodwill. Mm -hmm. 
there was some controversy over that, uh, and there was some pressure involved. Yes. Um, is that something that you felt at the time was a good idea for the company or a bad idea in retrospect? Well, I don't think no fire company wants to move once they're situated. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were we at the Cumberland were in the process of trying to purchase the Penn School Building property, which is next to the old fire station. Okay. Uh, we were promised that we could get it, and then the borough uh, manager got another deal with a realtor, and so we didn't get it. And we were working out of the, our, the front of the firehouse, plus we had a garage in the back that we had equipment in, uh, which that uh, the reason we were working in the back, the other reason was eventually in 74 we had a fire where we lost two members in the fire station. Mm -hmm. And the members got us. We got back in operation in '75, a year a year after that. Um, I believe that was June 27th, 1974. Were you at that fire? Yes, I came in. I wasn't that. I responded from home. Can you tell us briefly what your memories of that night are? I can re I can remember the smoke and the flames and the. Uh, Dick, Dick Schubert's uh, got the equipment out, and some of the other members that were there got got all the equipment out of the bay uh, in the front there on the Lotter Street entrance. Uh, it was hectic, uh, and it was uh, it was a shame that we lost two members. Uh -oh. One member was uh, lost that evening and then one member died a few days later, is that right? Uh, yes, I believe uh, the one member and, and then uh, the other person, yeah. And then the company um, had a few options but decided to stay at the current station and restore it, is that right? Yes, yep. Okay, and then a year later? In um, 84, then we, we, were, we were approached about uh, going to the Goodwill and, and uh, Housing there to Goodwill, uh, jointly with Good Goodwill, mm -hmm. and uh, so a little controversy on that with, with the older members at Cumberland, uh, but I got them straightened around and everybody agreed. So you were the president of the Cumberland when that happened. Yes. And then after the merger, you were the president of the Cumberland Goodwill, the merged company. Uh, up until the merger with uh, today. Okay. In 2010. Mm -hmm. um, during that time period when you were operating as the Cumberland Goodwill on Ridge Street, um, there were quite a bit of changes, especially on the EMS side of the company. Um, a lot of the volunteers um, became paid staff just because of the call volume and the training and had mm -hmm. to be done that the state you know needed. Uh, and the same with the, the drivers and the, and the firefighters. I mean, the volunteer system sort of faded out. Yeah. That's one of the things that I was going to ask you about a little bit later. Um, during your experiences over almost 50 years, um, you've seen the volunteer system change quite a bit, especially in regards to the number of people available. Um, is that something that you think that we're going to be able to sustain? Um, or do you think that the volunteer system is going to go away? Uh, I hope it doesn't, but uh, younger people when, younger people that joined the fire station, uh, you know, they were young and single then and eventually uh, got married and have a family. So that, that hurt uh, a little bit there because they, they couldn't be as obligated as what they were when they were single. And, and I understand that, but yeah, sooner or later I, I would imagine that the volunteer system will not be volunteer anymore. You mentioned briefly um, the fact that the Cumberland Goodwill was asked again to um, consider merging, and the company decided to do that and, and merge with the Empire Friendship Fire Company in 2009. Uh, it took effect in early 2010. 
and we became Carlisle Fire and Rescue Services, which is the museum that we're in right now. Um, looking back uh, six years, um, do you think that that was a good idea, or do you think that... Uh, My opinion, yes. Okay. Uh, I, I was... Everything that was done with the goodwill, we merged to the goodwill, it was all taken before the company. Uh, there were some uh, company members that didn't like it, and that I took a lot of flack from. Uh, but, you know, it was a company decision. Okay. Uh, before we wrap up, I'd like to just talk about your, your personal uh, things a little bit. You have children? Yes. How many? I have uh, uh, two natural children, uh, my son and my daughter. My daughter and my son, and my daughter's the oldest. And then uh, my wife was deceased, I was married to. She has four children. Okay. Um, throughout your life, I'm sure you've had many hobbies. I know one of them is um, you're a pretty good carver. Is that something? I carve. That you, yeah, uh, you carve wood objects. Uh, yes, sir. Is that something that you're still uh, doing? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. Um, any other interesting hobbies or anything? Well, other than hunting and fishing, which I I don't do too much about that. I go since I since I uh, got injured or whatever. And, mm hmm I I uh, I go hunting out of the farm uh, every year for half a day. Now this past year, uh, when I got out of the hospital, I actually went for uh, a day and a half. I uh, was setting up in the, in the woods. Excellent. Shooting, I like to shoot uh, firearms. I was an instructor uh, at the sheriff's office uh, for several for many years. And also at the police department for many years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think that's all the questions that I have. Is there anything else that you'd like to mention to uh, to have on the record? Uh, the only thing I would mention is that I want to thank you for having the opportunity to give this information. I hope it helps. Okay, Jake. Well, thank you very much. One more thing. Okay. Uh, when I first started on the police department, on West, on High Street and Hanover Street, before your time, the uh, parking was angular parking, mm -hmm. and then they got away from it and put it long, straight, horizontal, and now. And that, now, now we have the road diet. That's correct. <laughs> All right, Jake. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Michael.